Chapter Twenty Two of *The Skylark of Valeron* by E. E. Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two. In the throne room of Condal, with its gorgeously resplendent jeweled ceiling and jeweled metallic tapestry walls, there were seated in earnest consultation the three most powerful men of the planet Osnome, Roban and Carfedix, Emperor. Dunark the Kofedix, Crown Prince, and Tornan the Corbix, President of the Church and Commander-in-Chief of all armed forces of Osnome. Their clothing was the ordinary Osnomian regalia of straps, chains, and metallic bands, all thickly bestudded with blazing gems, and for the most part supporting the full assortment of devastatingly powerful hand weapons without which any man of that race would have felt stark naked. Their fierce green faces were keenly hawk-like. The hard, clean lines of their bare green bodies bespoke the rigid physical training that every Osnomian undergoes from birth until death. "'Father, Tarnan may be right,' Donark was saying soberly. "'We are too savage, too inherently bloodthirsty, too deeply interested in killing, not as a means to some really worthwhile end, but as an end in itself. Seton, the overlord, thinks so, the Norlaminians think so, and I am beginning to think so myself. All really enlightened races look upon us as little better than barbarians, and in part I agree with them. I believe, however, that if we were really to devote ourselves to study and to productive effort, we could soon equal or surpass any race in the system except, of course, the Norlaminians. "'There may be something in what you say,' the Emperor admitted dubiously. "'But it is against all our racial teachings. What, then, of an outlet for the energies of all manhood?' "'Constructive effort instead of destructive,' argued the Corbex. "'Let them build, study, learn, advance. It is all too true that we are far behind other races in the system in all really important things.' But what of Orvan and his people? Roban brought up his last and strongest argument. They are as savage as we are, if not more so. As you say, the necessity for continuous warfare ceased with the destruction of Mardanale. But are we to leave our whole planet defenseless against an interplanetary attack from Orvania? They dare not attack us, declared Tornan any more than we dare attack them. Seton the Overlord decreed that the people of us too, first to attack the other, dies root and branch, and we all know that the word of the Overlord is no idle passing breath. But he has not been seen for long. He may be far away, and the Urvanians may decide at any time to launch their fleets against us. However, before we decide this momentous question, I suggest that you two pay a visit of state to the court of Orvan. Talk to Orvan and his Carbex as you have talked to me, of cooperation and of mutual advancement. If they will cooperate, we will. During the long voyage to Orvania, the third planet of the fourteenth sun, however, their new ardor cooled perceptibly particularly that of the younger man, and in Orvan's palace it became clear that the love of peaceful culture inculcated upon those fierce minds by contact with more humane peoples could not supplant immediately the spirit of strife bred into bone and fiber during thousands of generations of incessant warfare. For when the two Osnomians sat down with the two Orvanians, the very air seemed charged with animosity. Like strange dogs meeting with bared fangs and bristling manes, Osnomian and Orvanian alike fairly radiated hostility. Therefore Tornan's suggestions as to cooperation and understanding were decidedly unconvincing, and were received with open scorn. "'Your race may well wish to cooperate with ours,' sneered the Emperor of Urvania. 
since but for the threats of that self-styled overlord you would have ceased to exist long since and how do we know where that one is what he is doing whether he is paying any attention to us probably you have learned that he has left this system entirely and have already planned an attack upon us in self-defense we shall probably have to wipe out your race to keep you from destroying ours at any rate your plea is very evidently some underhanded trick of your weak and cowardly race weak cowardly us you conceited bloated toad stormed dunark who had kept himself in check thus far only by sheer power of will he sprang to his feet his stool flying backward here and now i demand a meeting of honor if you know the meaning of the word honor the four enraged men all drawing weapons were suddenly swept apart then clutched and held immovably as a figure of force materialized among them the form of an aged white-bearded norlaminian peace children and silence the image commanded sternly rest assured that there shall be no more warfare in this system and that the decrees of the overlord shall be enforced to the letter calm yourselves and listen i know well mind you that none of you really meant what has just been said you of osnome were so impressed by the benefits of mutual helpfulness that you made this journey to further its cause you of urvania are at heart also strongly in favor of it but neither of you has strength enough or courage enough to admit it for no vain and self-willed children that it is weakness not strength which you have been displaying it may well be however that your physical bravery and your love of strife can now be employed for the general good of humanity would you join hands to fight side by side in such a cause we would chorused the four as one each was heartily ashamed of what had just happened and was glad indeed of the opportunity to drop it without losing face very well we of norlamin fear greatly that we have inadvertently given to one of the greatest foes of universal civilization weapons equal in power to the overlord's own and that he is even now working to undo all that has been done will you of osnome and you of orvania help in conducting an expedition against that foe we will they exclaimed dunark added who is that enemy and where is he to be found he is dr mark c duquesne of earth duquesne barked dunark why i thought the fenachrone killed him but we shall attend to it at once when i kill anyone he stays killed just a moment son the image cautioned he has surrounded earth with defenses against which your every arm would be entirely impotent come you to norlamin bringing each of you one hundred of his best men we shall have prepared for you certain equipment which although it may not enable you to emerge victorious from the engagement will at least ensure your safe return it might be well also to stop at dasor which is not now far from your course of flight and bring along sokner Korfon, who will be of great assistance being a man both of action and of learning but to cain raved dunark who realized immediately what must have happened why didn't you ray him on sight didn't you know what a liar and a thief he is by instinct and training we had no suspicion then who he was thinking as did you that duquesne had passed he came under another name as seaton's friend he came as one possessing knowledge with fair and plausible words but of that we shall inform you later come at once we shall place upon your controls forces which shall pilot you accurately and with speed 
Upon the aqueous world of Dasor they found its amphibious humanity reveling in an activity which, although dreamed of for centuries, had been impossible of realization until the Skylark had brought to them a supply of Rovalon, the metal of power. Now cities of metal were arising here and there above her waves. Airplanes and helicopters sped through and hovered in her atmosphere. Barges and pleasure craft sailed the almost unbroken expanse of ocean which was her surface. Immense submarine freighters bored their serene, stolid ways through her watery depths. Sockner Carfon, the porpoise like, hairless, naked Dasorian counselor, heaved his six and a half feet of height and his five hundred weight of mass into Dunark's vessel and greeted the Osnomian prince with a grave and friendly courtesy. Yes, friend, everything is wonderfully well with Dasor, he answered Dunark's query. Now that our one lack, that of power, has been supplied, our lives can at last be lived to the full, unhampered by the limitations which we have hitherto been compelled to set upon them. But this from Norlamin is terrible news indeed. What know you of it? During the trip to Norlamin, the three leaders not only discussed and planned among themselves, but also had many conferences with the advisory five of the planet toward which they were speeding so that they arrived upon that ancient world with a complete knowledge of what they were to attempt. There Roval and Drosnik instructed them in the use of fifth-order forces, each according to his personality and ability. To Sockner Carfon was given high command, and he was instructed minutely in every detail of the power, equipment, and performance of the vessel which was to carry the hope of civilization. To Tarnan, the best balanced of his race, was given a more limited knowledge. Dunark and Orvan, however, were informed only as to the actual operation of the armament, with no underlying knowledge of its nature or construction. "'I trust that you will not resent this necessary caution,' Drosnik said carefully. "'Your natures are as yet essentially savage and bloodthirsty.' Your reason is all too easily clouded by passion. You are, however, striving truly, and that is a great good. With a few mental operations, which we shall be glad to give you at a later time, you shall both be able to take your places as leaders in the march of your peoples toward civilization. Fodan, majestic chief of the five, escorted the company of warriors to their battleship of space. And what a ship she was! Fully twice the size of Skylark Three in every dimension she lay there, surcharged with power and might, awaiting only her commander's touch to hurl herself away toward distant and now inimical Earth. But the vengeful expedition was too late by far. Duquesne had long since consolidated his position. His chain of interlinked power stations encircled the globe. Governments were in name only. World Steel now ruled the entire Earth, and Duquesne's power was absolute. Nor was that rule as yet unduly onerous. The threat of war was gone. The tyranny of gangsterism was done. Everybody was working for high wages. What was there to kick about? Some men of vision, of course, perceived the truth, and were telling it, but they were being howled down by the very people they were trying to warn. It was thus against an impregnably fortified world that Dunark and Orvan directed every force with which their flying super-dreadnought was armed. Nor was she feeble, this monster of the skyways. But Duquesne had known well what form the attack would take, and, having the resources of the world upon which to draw, he had prepared to withstand the amassed assault of a hundred such vessels, or a thousand. Therefore the attack not only failed, it was repulsed crushingly. For from his massed generators Duquesne hurled out upon the Norlaminian spaceship a solid beam of such incredible intensity that, in neutralizing its terrific order, her store of power uranium dwindled visibly, second by second. So rapidly did the metal disappear that Sockner Carfon, 
after waging the unequal struggle for some twenty hours, put on high acceleration and drove back toward the central system, despite the raging protests of Dunark and his equally tempestuous fellow lieutenant. And in his private office, which was also a complete control room, Duquesne smiled at Brookings, a hard, thin smile. Now you see, he said coldly, suppose I hadn't spent all that time and money on my defenses. Well, why don't you go out and chase him? Give him a scare, anyway. Because it would be useless, Duquesne stated flatly. That ship carries more stuff than anything we have ready to take off at present. Also, Dunark does not scare. You might kill him, but you can't scare him. It isn't in the breed. Well, what is the answer, then? You have tried to take Norlamin with everything you've got, bombs, automatic ships, and projectors, and you haven't got to first base. You can't even get through their outside screens. What are you going to do? Let it go on as a stalemate? Hardly, Duquesne smiled thinly. While I do not make a practice of divulging my plans, I am going to tell you a few things now, so that you can go ahead with more understanding, and hence with greater confidence. Seaton is out of the picture, or he would have been back here before this. The Fenachrone are all gone. Dunark and his people are unimportant. Norlamin is the only known obstacle between me and the mastery of the galaxy. Therefore, Norlamin must either be con conquered or destroyed. Since the first alternative seems unduly difficult, I shall destroy her. Destroy Norlamin? How? The thought of wiping out that world, with all its ancient culture, did not appall, did not even affect Brookings's callous mind. He was merely curious concerning the means to be employed. The whole job so far has been merely a preliminary toward that destruction," Duquesne informed him levelly. I am now ready to go ahead with the second step. The planet Pluto is, as you may or may not know, very rich in uranium. The ships which we are now building are to carry a few million tons of that metal to a large and practically uninhabited planet not too far from Norlamin. I shall install driving machinery upon that planet, and, using it as a projectile which all their forces cannot stop, I shall throw Norlamin into her own sun." Raging but impotent, Dunark was borne back to Norlamin, and, more subdued now but still bitterly humiliated, he accompanied Orvan, Sockner Carfon, and the various Firsts to a consultation with the Five. As they strolled along through the grounds, past fountains of flaming color, past fantastically geometric hedges intricately and ornately wrought of noble metal, past walls composed of self-luminous gems so moving as to form fleeting, blending pictures of exquisite line and color, Sockner Carfon eyed Drasnik in unobtrusive signal, and the two dropped gradually behind. I trust that you were successful in whatever it was you had in mind to do while we set up the late diversion, Corfon asked quietly, when they were out of earshot. Dunark and Orvan, his fierce and fiery aides, had taken everything that had happened at its face value, but not so had the leader. Unlike his lieutenants, the massive Dasorian had known at first blast that his expedition against Duquesne was hopeless. More. It had been clear to him that the Norlaminians had known from the first that their vessel, enormous as she was, and superbly powerful, could not crush the defenses of Earth. "'We knew, of course, that you would perceive the truth,' the first of psychology replied as quietly. "'We also knew that you would appreciate our reasons for not taking you fully into our confidence in advance. Tornan of Osnome also had an inkling of it and I have already explained matters to him. Yes, we succeeded. While Duquesne's whole attention was taken up in resisting your forces and in returning them in kind, we were able to learn much that we could not have learned otherwise. 
Also our young friends Donark and Irvon, through being chastened, have learned a very helpful lesson. They have seen themselves in true perspective for the first time, and, having fought side by side in a common, and so far as they knew, a losing cause, they have become friends instead of enemies. Thus it will now be possible to inaugurate upon those two backward planets a program leading toward true civilization. In the Hall of the Five the Norlaminian spokesman voiced thanks and appreciation for the effort just made, concluding, while as a feat of arms the expedition may not have been a success, in certain other respects it was far from being a failure. By its help we were enabled to learn much, and I can assure you now that the foe shall not be allowed to prevail. It is graven upon the sphere that civilization is to go on. May I ask a question, sir? Irvon was, for the first time in his bellicose career, speaking diffidently. Is there no way of landing a real storming force upon Earth? Must we leave Duquesne in possession indefinitely? We must wait, son, and work, the chief answered, with the fatalistic calm of his race. At present we can do nothing more, but in time— he was interrupted by a deafening blast of sound, the voice of Richard Seaton tremendously amplified. This is the Skylark calling Roval of Norleman. Skylark calling Roval of Norleman, it repeated over and over, rising to a roar and diminishing to a whisper as Seaton's broadcaster oscillated violently through space. Roval laid a beam to the nearest transmitter and spoke. I am here, son. What is it? Fine. I'm away out here in— Hold on a minute, Dick, Dunark shouted. He had been humble and sober enough since his return to Narlamin, realizing as he never had before his own ignorance in comparison with the gigantic minds about him, the powerlessness of his entire race in comparison with the energies he had so recently seen in action. But now, as Seaton's voice came roaring in, and Roval and his brain brother were about to indulge so naively and so publicly in a conversation which certainly should not reach Duquesne's ears, his spirits rose. Here was something he could do to help. Duquesne is alive, has Earth completely fortified, and is holding it against everything we can give him, Dunark went on rapidly. He's got everything we have, maybe more, and he's undoubtedly listening to every word we're saying. Talk more than alien. I know for a fact that Duquesne can't understand that. They've got an educator here, and I'll give it to Roval right now. All right, go ahead. I'm clear out of the galaxy, Seaton's voice went on now speaking the language of the Osnomian race which had so recently been destroyed. So many galaxies away that none of you except Orlon could understand the distance. The speed of transmission is due to the fact that we have perfected, and I am using, a sixth-order projector, not a fifth. Have you a ship fit for really long-distance flight, as big as three was, or bigger? Yes, we have a vessel twice her size. Fine. Load her up and start. Head for the great nebula in Andromeda. Orlon knows what and where that is. That isn't very close to my line, but it will do until you get some apparatus set up. I've got to have Roval, Drosnik, and Orlon, and I would like to have Fodon. You can bring along anybody else that wants to come. I'll sign on again in an hour. You should be started by then. Besides the four Norlaminians mentioned, Kaslor, first of mechanism, and Astron, first of energy, also elected to make this stupendous flight, as did many youngsters from the country of youth. Dunark would not be left behind, nor would adventurous Orvon. And lastly there was Sokner Karfon, the Dasorian, who remarked that he would have to go along to make the boys behave, and to steer the ship in case the old professors forgot to. The spaceship was well on its way when at the end of the hour Seaton's voice again was heard. "'All right. Put me on a recorder, and I'll give you the dope,' he instructed, when he had made sure that his signal was received. "'Duquesne has been trying to put a ray on us, and he may try to follow us,' Dunark put in. 
Let him, Seaton shot back grimly, then spoke in English. Duquesne, Dunark says that you're listening in. You have my urgent, if not cordial, in invitation to follow this Norlaminian ship. If you follow it far enough, you'll take a long, long ride, believe me. Again addressing the voyagers, he recounted briefly everything that had occurred since the abandonment of Skylark Three, then dived abruptly into the fundamental theory and practical technique of six-order phenomena and forces. Of that ultra-mathematical dissertation, Donark understood not even the first sentence. Sockner Carfon perhaps grasped dimly a concept here and there. The Norlaminians, however, sat back in their seats, relaxed and smiling, their prodigious mentalities not only absorbing greedily but assimilating completely the enormous doses of mathematical and physical science being thrust upon them so rapidly. And when that epoch-making, that almost unbelievable tale was done, not one of the aged scientists even referred to the tape of the recorder. "'Oh, wonderful, wonderful!' exclaimed Roval in ecstasy, his transcendental imperturbability broken at last. "'Think of it! Our knowledge extended one whole order farther in each direction, both into the small and into the large, magnificent, and by one brain, and that of a youth, extraordinary. And we may now traverse universal space in ordinary time, because that brain has harnessed the practically infinite power of cosmic radiation, a power which exhausted the store of uranium carried by Skylark Three in forty hours. Phenomenal! Stupendous! But do not forget that the brain of that youth is a composite of many, said Fodon thoughtfully, and that in it, among others, were yours and Dunark's. Seaton himself ascribes to that peculiar combination his successful solution of the problem of the Sixth Order. You know, of course, that I am in no sense belittling the native power of that brain. I am merely suggesting that perhaps other noteworthy discoveries may be made by superimposing brains in other but equally widely divergent fields of thought. An interesting idea, truly, and one which may be fruitful of result, assented Orlon, the first of astronomy. But I would suggest that we waste no more time. I, for one, am eager to behold with my own inner consciousness the vistas of the galaxies. Agreeing, the five white-bearded scientists seated themselves at the multiplex console of their fifth-order installation and set happily to work. Their gigantic minds were undaunted by the task they faced. They were only thrilled with interest at the opportunity of working with magnitudes, distances, forces, objects, and events at the very contemplation of which any ordinary human mind would quail. Steadily and contentedly they worked on, while at the behest of their nimble and unerring fingers there came into being the forces which were to build into their own vessel a duplicate of the mechano-electrical brain which actuated and controlled the structure, almost of planetary proportions, in which Seaton was even then hurtling toward them hurtling with a velocity rapidly mounting to a value incalculable, driven by the power liberated by the disintegrating matter of all the suns of all the galaxies of all the universes of cosmic space. End of chapter 22